Hello guys. So today we are going to continue with our series on combined science paper 2 that was written in June 2020. We are going to discuss section C which is the chemistry section. In the final exam, candidates are required to answer in two questions, but we are going to answer all the questions from number 10 to number 12. So number 10A is reading, state the type of bonding in magnesium oxide. So the type of bonding in magnesium oxide is known as ionic bonding, also known as electrovalent bonding. So ionic bonding occurs when a metal and a non-metal reacts together. For example, in this case, magnesium is our metal and then our um, non-metal is oxygen. So they are going to be combined by ionic bonding whereby magnesium is going to lose electrons and then oxygen is going to gain the electrons in order to gain stability. And then on part two, we are supposed to describe how magnesium oxide can be pre prepared. So magnesium oxide can be prepared by heating magnesium metal in the presence of oxygen. So this is what happens. We are going to have um, our magnesium, which is in solid uh, reacting with oxygen which is a gas, in order to form magnesium oxide. So we need, we need two moles of magnesium and one mole of oxygen in order to form two moles of magnesium oxide. So this is how we prepare magnesium oxide. And then on part B, we are supposed to describe giving a reason why magnesium oxide does not react with copper? Magnesium oxide uh, do not react with copper because magnesium is higher on the reactivity series. Therefore, copper cannot displace magnesium. There is no reaction that is going to okay. Let me repeat to explain again. We are supposed to describe giving a reason why magnesium oxide does not react with copper? So magnesium do not react with copper because magnesium is more reactive than copper. It is on the it is higher on the active series. Therefore, copper cannot displace magnesium. There is no reaction that is going to okay. And then on C part one, we are supposed to calculate the molecular mass of magnesium oxide. So the chemical formula of magnesium oxide is MgO. We are having magnesium and oxygen being combined together. So the molecular mass of magnesium is 24 if we check on the periodic table. And then the molecular mass of oxygen is 16. We are going to say the molecular mass of magnesium oxide is 24 plus 16, which is equals to 40 grams. So this is the molecular mass of magnesium oxide. And then on C part two, we are supposed to calculate the percentage of oxygen in magnesium oxide. So um, the formula is we are going to say mass of oxygen divided by mass of oxygen plus mass of magnesium times 100 percent so the mass of oxygen is 16 and then the mass of oxygen plus the mass of magnesium is 40 we multiply by 100 percent so we say 8 into 16 we get 2 8 into 4 we get 5 5 into 5, 1, 5 into 100, it is 20. And then we say 2 times 20, we are going to obtain 40. So our answer is 40%. That was all about number 10. Let, let me summarize the answers. On number 10A, part 1,
we're supposed to state the type of bonding in magnesium oxide. It is known as ionic bonding or electrovalent bonding. And then we are supposed to describe how magnesium oxide can be prepared. It is prepared by heating magnesium metal in the presence of oxygen. And then on part B, we are supposed to describe a reason, giving a reason why magnesium oxide does not react with copper. So magnesium uh, do not react with copper. Sorry. This is because magnesium is higher on the active series. Therefore, copper cannot displace magnesium. There is no reaction that is going to okay. And then on C part one, we are supposed to calculate the molecular mass of magnesium oxide. We are going to say the mass of magnesium, which is 24, plus the mass of oxygen, which is 16, in order to get 40 grams. And then on C part two, we are supposed to calculate the percentage of oxygen in magnesium oxide. We are going to say mass of oxygen over the mass of magnesium oxide times 100% in order to get 40%. So let us move on to number 11. Number 11A, calcium sulfate can be formed from the reaction between calcium carbonate in the solution X, two other substances are produced during the reaction. You're supposed to name the solution X. So you should know that this is a neutralization reaction. We are having an acid plus base in order to form salt, water, and carbon dioxide. So the acid that we are going to use is sulfuric acid. So the chemical formula of sulfuric acid is H2SO4. This is uh, where we are going to obtain the, sulf the calcium sulfate. The this is the origin of the sulfate. And then on part two, we are supposed to give the two other products. So we are saying um, we are reacting calcium carbonate plus sulfuric acid in order to form calcium sulfate. And then you should always know that when we react um, acid in a base, we are going to obtain um, water and salt. So this is our salt. And then we have water. And then uh, this carbonate is going to uh, be broken down to give carbon dioxide. So the two other products that we have are water and carbon dioxide. And then on part three, name the type of reaction that occurs between calcium carbonate in solution X, which is sulfuric acid. So the reaction is known as neutralization reaction. Part four is reading, to prepare a pure sample of calcium sulfate, excess calcium carbonate is to be added to the solution X. Explain why the calcium carbonate should be in excess. So you should always know that whenever making a soluble salt, you should add the base in excess to ensure that all the acid is reacted to form a salt. And then on part V, name the process that is used to separate excess calcium carbonate from the calcium sulfate solution. Calcium carbonate is fairly insoluble stuff. The process of filtration can be used to separate it from the calcium sulfate solution. Calcium carbonate being insoluble, it is going to remain on the pores of filter paper and is separated from the calcium sulfate solution by this method. And then on B part one, the strength of an acid or a base can be determined using the pH scale. We're supposed to state the pH values on the pH scale. 
So the values ranges from 1 to 14. And then on part 2, we are supposed to give the pH value that represents a neutral substance. So the pH value for neutral substance is 7. You should understand that the pH from 1 to 6 is acidic, 7 is neutral, and then 8 to 14 is basic. And um, the strength of foam acid is higher when the pH is low, and then in basis, the higher the pH, the higher the basic um, the solution is. And then on part C, we are supposed to list N2 properties of alkaline substances. So the key word here is alkaline substances. It means that we are not going to talk about alkaline metals, but uh, we are talking about alkaline substances. Examples of alkaline substances are um, oven cleaner. It contains uh, the sodium hydroxide, which is also known as caustic soda. And then we have uh, the baking soda. And then we also have the indigestion tablets, soap, washing powder, bleach. These are examples of alkaline substances. So we are supposed to list N2 properties of alkaline substances. So the first property that I'm going to explain is that they are strong bases because they are going to turn litmus paper from red to blue. They react, they react with acids to produce neutral salts. Another property of alkaline substance is that they are caustic and in concentrated form, they are corrosive to organic tissues. Let me summarize number 11. On number 11A, we're supposed to name the solution X that is going to react with calcium carbonate in order to produce calcium sulfate. It is sulfuric acid. And then we're supposed to give the uh, other two products besides uh, calcium sulfate, these are water and carbon dioxide. And then on part three, we're supposed to name the reaction that occurs between calcium carbonate and sulfuric acid. It is neutralization reaction. And then we're supposed to explain why calcium carbonate is added in excess. This is to ensure that all the acid Yes, reacted in order to form the salt. And then on part f five, we're supposed to name the process that is used to separate excess calcium carbonate from the calcium sulfate solution. It is filtration. And then on B, we're supposed to state the pH values on the pH scale. They range from 1 to 14. And then on part two, we're supposed to give the pH value that represents a neutral substance, it is seven. And then on part C, we're supposed to list N2 properties of alkaline substances. There are strong bases that turn litmus paper from red to blue. They react with acids to produce neutral salts and they are caustic and in concentrated form, they are corrosive to organic tissues let us move on to number 12. Number 12A is reading, dyes in black ink are separated using a strip of filter paper and a solvent. The ink is placed on the filter paper and the position of the ink is marked in pencil. The filter paper strip is dipped into the solvent, ensuring that the solvent is just below the ink. Uh, on part one, we are supposed to name the process that is used to separate the dyes in the black ink. So the process is known as chromatography. Let me explain what will be happening here. Usually a dye is a mixture of two or more colors. The colored component that is more soluble in water is going to rise faster and in this way, the colors get separated. 
and that process is known as chromatography. And then on part two, we are supposed to suggest with the reason a suitable solvent. So a suitable solvent for paper chromatograph is ethanol. So in part, in part two, we are supposed to give a reason why we have stated that ethanol is a suitable solvent. So ethanol is better solvent for chromatographic separation than water due to polar and non-polar interactions. Um, ethanol has ability to dissolve both polar and non-polar compounds. That is why it is a most suitable solvent for paper chromatography. And then on part three, we are supposed to explain why the position of the ink is marked in pencil and not in ink. So in paper chromatograph, a starting line is drawn using a pencil so that it does not dissolve in the solvent and affect the results. And then in part four, we are supposed to state two properties of dyes which make it possible to separate them. So these two properties are adsorption and solubility. So let me explain these two properties. Adsorption is the property of how well a substance in the mixture sticks to the chromatograph column. The higher the adsorption, the slower the substance will move along the column. And then for solubility, it is the property of how well a substance in the mixture dissolves into the solvent. So it means that if it um, dissolve quickly, it is going to move um, higher on the column. And then if it dissolves slowly, it is not going to move quickly in the column. And then on part five, we are supposed to name the force that enables the solvent to move up the filter paper. It is known as capillary action. Let me explain what is capillary action. It is the movement of water within spaces of porous material due to forces of adhesion, cohesion, and surface tension. And then on part B, we are supposed to state a method which can be used to separate ethanol from water. The process is known as fractional distillation. And then on part two, we are supposed to state a method which can be used to separate iron filings from sulfur. So we are going to use the magnet. We can separate uh, the compounds by steering the powder with a magnet. Uh, so the iron filings will stick to the magnet, while the sulfur is not going to stick. That was all about number 12. Let me summarize the answers. On number 12a, we're supposed to name the process that is used to separate the dyes in the black ink. We use a process that is known as chromatograph. And then on part two, we're supposed to suggest with a reason a suitable solvent that is used in chromatograph. It is the ethanol. Uh, the reason why we use ethanol, uh, ethanol is that it has ability to dissolve both polar and non-polar compounds. And then on part three, we're supposed to explain why the position of the ink is marked in pencil and not in ink so that it doesn't uh, dissolve in the solvent and affect the results. And then the two properties of dyes which make it possible to separate them is adsorption and solubility. And then the force that enables the solvent to move up the filter paper is capillary action. And then uh, the process that is used to separate ethanol from water is fractional distillation. And then the process of separating iron filings from sulfur is the use of magnet. This marks the end of our tutorial today on chemistry section that was examined in June 2020.
thank you so much guys for following me on this channel i really appreciate uh, your support you're supporting me by viewing you're supporting me by subscribing so um, this is eve signing out